has already been said that we are in our vacation Bible school week, kind of sort of kicking it off today, although the official launch of VBS is tomorrow morning as we will gather here, lots of adult volunteers and hopefully loads of kids. And we are, as Rocky said, so thankful that so many people choose to entrust our children or their children to us for that week. And certainly as you look around, I mean, I, you know, I, I saw, I watched, I enjoyed watching actually a little bit of, of the amazement as people walked in this morning, seeing the decorations, just the way things look and what's on stage here behind me, this incredible work that Carol Hale, Carol Hale did as she's so talented with that and Kate and the other volunteers that did the decorations and all of that is awesome and wonderful. But what's even more wonderful is that we're going to have more than 100 kids in here every day this week. And we get to talk to them about Jesus, about a God who loves them. And what I love are hearing stories, and I've heard them from some of you. I know some of you have told me it was a vacation Bible school where your parents brought you to a vacation Bible school. A good friend of mine who's a minister, his parents brought him to a vacation Bible school. And that was where he first heard about Jesus. That was where he first heard about a God who loved him. And it was in that vacation Bible school that he got set on what would become his life's path. And I think there could be this week somebody or maybe several somebodies who hear about Jesus for the first time. Whether it be that their parents were thinking, hey, vacation Bible school, we love vacation Bible school because we can drop our kids off and have a morning free. Whatever it was. We will have kids here who maybe get to hear about Jesus for the first time, and we can never lose sight of that. In fact, this morning, we're going to do this tomorrow morning as well. If you don't know, we've got a group that meets every Monday morning on a Zoom call to pray. We pray for renewal, revival, awakening in our community here in this church. But tomorrow morning, we're going to pray for Vacation Bible School and for what God will do. Not for what God can do. We know what He can do. But we're going to trust that God will do a work through our Vacation Bible School this year. And that there are chances that there are going to be people who hear, children who hear about Jesus for the first time. Or maybe for the first time they heard about Jesus in a way that really that changes something. Including their life's trajectory. And so I want to invite you to pray with me this morning as we begin this week that God would be at work in everything we do and say. God, it is my prayer, knowing that many lives have been changed, even at very young ages, through vacation Bible schools all around this nation and even all around the world. Through a week of focused and intense thinking about Jesus, about the stories from Scripture that we can connect with and sometimes even see ourselves in, and especially, Father, the change that takes place surrounding the understanding that, God, you, you love us. You care about us. You sent Jesus to be the light in the darkness. And now you've invited us to join your mission and to reflect your light everywhere we go. And so, God, I pray for all of us as adults that are serving that we would reflect your light well this week that this would be our aim, to be more like you, Jesus, to let people see you in us. And through that, God, they may come to know you. So God, we pray for the work you will do this week. In faith, we pray for the work you will do. God, I pray that 20, 25, 30 years from now, there would be someone who was here at this Vacation Bible School who can tell the story about how they first came to know about you and know you because of what happens this week. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. And the church said with me, amen. All right, well, we are going to be for the next two weeks, as Rocky kind of mentioned, just uh, kind of echoing, picking out just a few kind of hand-chosen stories that our kids will be walking through this week at Vacation Bible School. And so it's kind of fun for us as adults to know a little bit of what they will be looking at. And one of these stories happens to be probably one of my favorite stories from Scripture. 
Certainly one of my favorite stories about the way that Jesus interacts with somebody, because it's, it's a fun story in a lot of ways. It's the story about this, this short guy who came to know Jesus and to, who went to you know, fairly great lengths to kind of see Jesus and then Jesus' response to him. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But as we do, I want to kind of set the stage for something that we're going to be looking at this morning or the way at least we're going to frame this story. I want to ask you a question. How many of you guys, when it's an Olympic year, watch the Olympics pretty faithfully? Okay, quite a few. There's also a few that don't. I think, you know, certainly growing up as a kid, that was part of like a routine for us. Whether it was winter or summer Olympics, when the Olympics came around, we would watch the Olympics. We enjoyed doing that as a family together, even so much so that when the worlds would be on, which those happen every year and the Olympics happen every four years, right? Except that there's COVID and then that gets a little messed up, but, but the worlds happen every year. And so we would even walk the, watch the world, and I think it's called the World Athletic Championship, but it's basically track and field and other things that go along with that. So in 2008, when this happened, I was watching. Any of you guys remember that? I mean, a whole, lot of, a whole lot of people who didn't even watch the Olympics turned in, turned in or tuned in for this because we all knew this was going to be incredible, amazing, as this guy named Usain Bolt, whose nickname is Lightning Bolt. That's kind of cool. There have been some times where I've thought, if I could change my name to something, I'd probably change my name to Lightning Bolt. That would be fun, except it would be a lie in my case. In this guy's case, it's totally true. This guy is a Lightning Bolt. Right here already, and this was in 2008, when he won the 2008 Olympic 100-meter sprint, when he won and set the world record at the same time, right there in that picture, he was already pulling up. Like, he was already slowing down, and these other guys are just doing everything they can to catch him. But what I want you to know about these other guys, too, is they're all incredibly fast. I think there are only two guys in this heat who did not run under 10 seconds, the 100-meter sprint incredibly fast, incredibly fast. The next year in the 2009 Worlds, Usain Bolt again broke the world record, his own world record, and he still looked like he was kind of pulling up at the end. And he ran it in 9.58 seconds. I mean, unbelievably fast. This guy was flying down the track. Nobody's touched the record since. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind. These guys who are running, and they almost look like they're flying. And we're just going to change one thing. Well, two things, kind of. We're going to add an extra 10 meters to the race, and we're going to throw something else in the way. So you're probably familiar with the 100-meter sprint, right? But there's also this race called the 110-meter hurdles. And it doesn't always look quite as graceful as the guys that are running down the track, and they look like they're flying because there have been hurdles put in the way. Now, what I want you to know about these guys, this was also shot at a world championship, by the way. These guys are the top of their game, the top of their field. And if you were to throw them out there with those 100-meter sprinters, they'd probably be quite competitive, actually. They just decided to specialize in, someone else, in something else. But then there are times where they still look like this. So out of, I think, the eight guys that started this together, there were three. This guy right here got to the first hurdle over here and just stopped. The next two guys got to the first hurdle and fell and flipped. And this guy right over here is supposed to be the best in the world. So much can change when you throw a hurdle in the way, right? I mean, so much. I want you to think about this. Of course, yes, they're adding 10 seconds to the, or 10 meters to the race. So that's, that's one thing. But 10 meters is not all that much. Once these guys get up to speed, they're flying. But they also put hurdles in the way. And so remember, Usain Bolt can run 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. He could probably still finish 110 meters and ride at about 10 seconds. And watch what happens when you add some hurdles in the way. This is the world record, 12.8 seconds, more than three seconds slower than it is for the 100-meter sprint. Because the reality is when you throw hurdles in the way, that changes everything. I mean, you could try to just run through those hurdles, and we would all 
kind of giggle a little bit like we did when we saw those guys. You know, it's, it's, isn't it funny how we giggle at other people's misfortune? I mean, it's just kind of human nature. We, I'm sure those guys didn't feel so good, but we still kind of giggle. But throwing hurdles in the way changes everything. What I want you to see is that the story that we're about to look at this morning, this story of Zacchaeus, is actually a story about overcoming hurdles. It's a story about overcoming hurdles. And you'll see as we go through, there are three hurdles that had to be overcome to get to the end of the story, to finish the race, in a sense. If any one of these hurdles hadn't been overcome, there would have been a runner on the ground having tripped over a hurdle. But all three of these hurdles were jumped. So keep that in mind as we walk through this story together. All right, if you've got your Bibles, I'll invite you. You can open up to Luke chapter 19. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 10. If not, it will be on the screen behind me. Here's what Luke says. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Okay, so I want you to get the picture of what is happening here. Jesus is entering this city called Jericho on the way to Jerusalem as he's going to Jerusalem for the final week of his life. He had a lot of people who'd been following him by this time. And so Jesus comes into Jerusalem or Jer- Jericho with this crowd, his disciples and others that had been following him in this crowd. And so he was just passing through. That's what Jesus was doing. I mean, Luke lets us know plainly, Jesus didn't come to stop in Jericho, not really. I mean, his purpose was to pass through Jericho. But something happens while Jesus is in Jericho. There was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to know who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, all of you who grew up going to vacation Bible school like I did already knew this part about Zacchaeus, right? Because the song is forever indelibly stuck in your mind, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee... You guys even know to sing it with me. I should have, I should have just done that. I should have just, let's, let's sing the whole song together. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, right? So Zacchaeus was this wee little man. So we know this about Zacchaeus. He was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. Okay, so what we learn, I want you to see this. We learn a few things about Zacchaeus right away in the first few verses of this story. First, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. All right, Ter- Terry already mentioned this morning in his communion thoughts, if, if you've seen The Chosen, you kind of understand maybe you've had a visual representation of how tax collectors were viewed. Now, I want you to take that and multiply it by, multiply it by 10. Now, if you don't understand, Most of the time, tax collectors to the Jewish people were actually Jewish, and they were working for the Roman government, and the Roman government was the occupier and the oppressor. And so here were these Jewish people turning their back, in a sense, on their own people and becoming part of the occupying, oppressing force and saying, yes, I'll do that. Why? Well, because often, like Zacchaeus, they were going to become wealthy. Now, how did they become wealthy? Well, they got paid a bit for what they did by the Roman government, there's no doubt. But they were also given license by the Roman government to bump the taxes up just a little bit so that it would benefit them. So I want you to see again what Luke tells us about Zacchaeus. Luke says he was the chief tax collector of that region. So so he had a lot of tax collectors under him. So probably in the way that the tax structure went, you know, Zacchaeus probably did some work with some important clients collecting taxes, but he had all these minions who collected taxes. And then he got a little bit of kickback off the taxes that they collected as well as the taxes that he collected. And so if a tax collector was despised by most people as a turncoat, as someone who was a traitor, how do you think the chief tax collector was viewed? And then in case we wonder, was Zacchaeus any good at what he did? Luke tells us he was wealthy. So that right there gives us some real insight into Zacchaeus and how he would have been seen by his people who no longer saw him as one of 
their people. Now, we also learn about Zacchaeus that, that he wanted to see who Jesus was. I mean, there was a curiosity in him that day, even though all those other things about Zacchaeus were true. I mean, we'll see in a minute that, that Zacchaeus admits, embraces the reality that he had cheated and swindled people to get to where he was. He had not been an honorable tax collector, as if there was such a thing in the eyes of the first century Jewish people anyway. But he certainly had not been honorable in, what, in the way that he had operated. But in spite of all that, there was something stirring in his heart, some measure of curiosity. But here we come to our first hurdle. Zacchaeus was too short to see over the crowd. Now, I don't know how tall Zacchaeus really was. I mean, he was too short. Whatever that means, too short. You know, I, I can think about being, you know, at a parade a number of years ago. We were at a parade watching the parade. And my daughter, who was probably five, maybe six at that point in time, was too short to see over the crowd. So what did she want me to do? Well, Daddy, pick me up so that I can see too. So I did. I put her on my shoulders until she squirmed around a whole lot. And then I took her off my shoulders. And I said, okay, if you're going to sit on my shoulders, you got to sit still, right? But she knew she was too short to see over the crowd. Whatever picture you have in your mind, picture someone who needed something more to be able to see over these people. So this is the first hurdle. So what is Zacchaeus going to do to overcome this hurdle of wanting to see Jesus? Let's read on beginning in verse 4. Luke tells us this. So Zacchaeus, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, Jesus, since Jesus was coming that way. Now, I want you to think about this because this is kind of an insight and maybe a nuance that is often missed when we read this as just a cute story. But I want you to see the reality of what is happening in this moment. In Jewish society, Jewish culture, we know this from the story of the prodigal son too. Men, especially men who were dignified, did not run. You didn't run. You didn't hurry to stuff. You were important enough, you could walk your leisurely self at a nice slow pace to whatever, because whatever it was could wait for you. You did not run. That was beneath you. That was a sign of almost humbling yourself. So when the, in Luke 15, in the prodigal son story, when the father runs to the son, he's humbling himself to come meet the son. In this story, the same is true in Luke 19. As Zacchaeus runs ahead, people have been watching him run, and they would have been looking at him thinking, what is this guy doing? Why is he embarrassing himself this way by running? Well, Zacchaeus had a good reason to embarrass himself. And we can also see that there's a measure of humility in the way that he is wanting to get to where he can see Jesus. Now, second thing he does, also not dignified in that culture whatsoever for a grown man to climb a tree. Now, be honest. If you see a grown man climbing a tree right now, you'd probably wonder a little bit, hey, what's going on with that guy? What's he doing? Because kids climb trees. Grown men don't climb trees, right? Unless we're getting down cats and we're firemen. Then we can climb trees. But this man, Zacchaeus, a wealthy, dignified man, is running and climbing trees. He wants to see Jesus that badly. Now, here's what happened, verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, because you look super silly up there. No, he didn't say that at all. He said, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Verse 6. So he came down and welcomed him gladly. I mean, that's what Zacchaeus was looking for. Can I interface, engage with Jesus? Is there any way that maybe we'll just lock eyes for a second? And it goes so much more, so much further than locking eyes for a second. So Zacchaeus gladly came down at once, and he welcomes Jesus gladly. Verse 7, all the people saw this and cheered because it's a feel-good story. No, they didn't. All the people saw this, and they began to mutter. Another way that word is sometimes translated is grumble. I mean, they were grumbling, muttering. You ever been in a situation where something happens and 
all of a sudden you start to just hear a murmur in the crowd, a muttering in the crowd, a grumbling in the crowd, because what has just happened, well, it's not supposed to happen. And here's why, according to these people. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So the second hurdle in the story is this, and we already know how this one works out because we just read it. The second hurdle is this. Would Jesus, the Son of God, associate with a man like Zacchaeus? Would Jesus, the Son of God, humble himself and become a guest of a sinner? And the answer to that is yes, but I I want you to see the hurdle that Jesus was having to cross, to jump over. Jesus was the Son of God, and in one sense, people, a lot of times, I mean, we even see this with the disciples sometimes, the perception was, Jesus, because of who you are, you have a reputation to maintain. So Jesus, let's make sure that you hang out with the right kind of people and not the wrong kind of people. Because if you start hanging out with the wrong kind of people, then everybody's going to do exactly what these guys did. They're going to mutter. They're going to grumble. They're going to mumble. They're going to think bad things about you. They may lose respect for you. They may start to question if you are who you say you are. So so Jesus, don't hang out with people like this. Don't spend time with people like this. Yet over and over again, we see Jesus spending time intentionally with sinners. The tax collectors, the sinners, and others. Jesus was willing to jump that hurdle regardless of what people said and thought about him. I mean, that to me is pretty amazing. If I think about coming to, you know, if, if I was Jesus, and I'm not Jesus, right? But if I was Jesus, I'd think about it in my mind, and I'd think, okay, well, what kind of people do I really want to spend time with so that everybody will know who I am? You know, what's sad about me is, is if I was Jesus I might have started rubbing shoulders and bumping elbows with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the people who, these are the religious class. These are the people I need to be with. And yet Jesus so often seems to be drawn to the sinners, the ones that others were rejecting. So that's a hurdle that Jesus was willing to jump. If he didn't, we'd never have the ending that we have to this story. Beginning back in verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here now, I mean, imagine this. Right now, I'm not sure if he's yet come to Zacchaeus' house. I'm not sure if this was in front of the whole crowd. Is is this in the moment where Zacchaeus has just been called down out of that tree? Come with me. I'm going to your house. And Jesus turns and he starts walking. And maybe Zacchaeus grabs a hold of him and says, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know what's happening. I know what all these people are thinking. Let me tell you, Jesus, if you're willing to associate with me, let me tell you what I'm willing to do so I can follow you. Here's what Zacchaeus says. Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if, Zacchaeus is kind of speaking, maybe probably a little bit graciously about himself, if I've cheated anybody, I know I've cheated a lot of people, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, we've already talked about this some, but, but remember about Zacchaeus, he, he was a chief tax collector and he was, he was wealthy. He had a lot. And so many times when you have a lot, it's hard to give up anything, right? I mean, when, when you've lived your life to have lots and that has been the target you've set for your life, we're talking about an entire target shift Zacchaeus had said, this is the goal of my life. And then he stands before Jesus and says, if I can follow you, whatever I have to give up, that's going to be the goal of my life. So Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Which brings up this question that I think sometimes we wrestle with. Can someone who has lived such a far from God life be accepted by Jesus, right? I mean, that's part of this hurdle. Can someone who's lived such a far from God life be accepted by Jesus? That's what the crowd was wondering that day. That's what we sometimes wonder. 
Will Jesus really accept the worst of these? Will he? I mean, we, we've got stories of, of mass murderers coming to know Jesus. But in the back of our minds, we wonder, I wonder if that's real. Would Jesus really accept somebody who's lived a life like that? Would he? And then the second part of the hurdle, I think, is this. Can someone who's lived such a far from God life really want to follow Jesus? Now, this is the one I struggle with more, if I'm going to be honest with you. I don't typically struggle with, can God love someone who's lived such a far from God life? Yes, he can, 100%. I believe that is a testament to the grace of God. What I struggle with sometimes is believing that someone who's lived a life like that would really want to follow Jesus, which means sometimes I'm hesitant to share Jesus with somebody who I deem has lived really a far from God life. But both aspects of that hurdle were leaped over that day to get us to the end of the story, the end of this track, in a sense. I want you to see what Luke records Jesus saying in verse 9. He says, after he sees Zacchaeus' response, he says, Today salvation has come to this house. And I don't think he's just saying this to Zacchaeus. I get the feeling he's looking at the crowd in this moment, the same crowd who'd been mumbling and murmuring. He's looking at the crowd and he says, for this too is a son of Abraham. You've decided this guy is no longer one of you, but let me tell you, anyone who's willing to follow me is one of you. For the son of man, Jesus says, came to seek and save the lost. Here's what I want you to see out of this story as we wrap up. If we go back and we use the illustration that we started with at the beginning, church, we can never forget that Jesus came to jump the greatest hurdle ever. What none of us, not the furthest from God, not the closest to God, whatever, what none of us could do on our own, Jesus says, I'll do for you. What none of us could earn, Jesus says, I'll do for you, and I'll give it to you. You can have it. Why? Because as Luke says, and this is almost the mission statement for Jesus' ministry, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This puts me in mind of, of something else, another verse from Scripture written by a guy named the Apostle Paul. We call him the Apostle Paul. He was called Saul at the time that he was living a pretty far from God life. The church had just been established. Saul didn't really like the church all that much, and so he started to persecute the church. In fact, at the stoning of a young man named Stephen, who was following Jesus, so as, as a bunch of people are throwing rocks at this guy, Saul was standing there and saying, hey guys, just, just so that you can throw and really follow through, let me hold your jackets. You, you don't want to be encumbered by those long sleeves. Let me hold your coats for you. Let me hold your cloaks. Saul stood there and watched and approved and was part of probably many more such events. In fact, just before he meets Jesus, he had gone to the chief priest so that he could get letters to throw more Christians in prison. So I want you to see what Saul turned Paul says about himself in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. So speculation is that what comes next was a saying in the first century church. It was repeated often, this next little bit of the sentence. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The church said it over and over and over again. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Hey guys, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He came to seek and save the lost. And then Paul adds, of who I am the chief. So we've seen the chief tax collector and the chief sinner, and Jesus came to seek him and seek and save him out, save both of them. So I've got a couple questions for you as we wrap up. What hurdles stand between Jesus and you as you seek to follow him more faithfully? I mean, Zacchaeus had a few hurdles that he needed to try to jump, that he needed to get over. 
What hurdles stand between you and Jesus as you seek to follow him more faithfully? And the second question, as it relates to others, do you rejoice or grumble when you see Jesus embrace someone who's lived a far from God life? Church, let's be the kind of people that rejoice and that join Jesus in helping to see others come to see him because he came to jump the greatest hurdle ever. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that, um, that as we read this story, and we've seen it as a simple story for so long, so many of us, that we would see the depth in this story, the depth of truth in this story, that Jesus, you came to seek and save the lost. Jesus, you came to save sinners. Thank God, because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And God, help us be the kind of people that rejoice when we see people come to know you, no matter what kind of life they've lived. And God, let us be the kind of people that are willing to get rid of the hurdles in our life so we can follow you, Jesus, more closely. This is my prayer. And together the church said, amen.